I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss reports that Ukrainian armed forces have destroyed the Wagner Group's headquarters in Luhansk, and analyse the influence of Putin's new general Armageddon, Sergei Sorovkin. Plus, the human cost of this war grows by the day. But what about the pets Ukrainians were forced to leave behind? David Knowles speaks to the CEO of the U Hearts Foundation, whose organization cares for animals misplaced due to the invasion of Ukraine. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 12th of December, day 292. And today, I'm joined by Assistant Common Editor Francis Dernley and our foreign correspondent, Jane Kilner. I started by asking Francis for the latest updates on the military front. Well, thank you, Claire, and good afternoon to all of our listeners around the world from a snow-covered London. I'm going to start with the big news from the weekend, which I'm sure many of our listeners may have heard uh, from other news outlets or our own, which is about uh, Ukraine saying they've destroyed Wagner's HQ in Luhansk. Of course, we've spoken about the Wagner group, the mercenary group that's working very closely with the Russian army in Ukraine uh, much on this podcast. But the significance of this event is just the scale of it. Um, there's, I should say from the off the bat that there's quite a lot of confused messaging around this. The Russians are claiming that this strike on their headquarters in Luhansk is fairly minimal. And whilst we've seen footage, they're claiming that it's only killed, I think, about three to five people. But the Ukrainians are claiming that this is an absolutely major attack, which has led to as many as 200 uh, Wagner deaths. And as I say, that is not independently verified. We're looking into it. But that is the, the kind of headline that we're seeing here. And the footage is in, in very, very striking indeed. It shows a, a hotel that supposedly the Wagner group were using in Luhansk as their headquarters. And it's essentially destroyed completely and is rubble, a pile of rubble. And uh, w- there's been numerous commentary on this over the weekend. The uh, Ukraine's governor has said that there was an explicit attack on the hotel from Ukrainian forces and the Russians had suffered major losses in the attack. As I say, Wagner have, have not commented this on this explicitly, but um, Russian officials have said that whilst the attack did take place, that the attack was uh, nowhere near as significant in scale as the Ukrainians are making out. But I think the... The optical significance of this is as significant, perhaps, as the losses uh, that the Russia may or may not have suffered here. It's a really significant attack. And if one looks at footage of this, you can see the scale of the devastation, as I say. And the fact that Ukraine have been able to launch this strike, supposedly it's been launched by uh, HIMARS um, on this scale, uh, on a place that clearly was quite considerably behind enemy lines is, as I say, very significant indeed. And it comes off the back, of course, Ukraine claiming that they destroyed another of Wagner's bases in Luhansk back in August. So some people are speculating that this was the successor headquarters and that's what's been struck by Ukraine and effectively destroyed uh, in the last sort of 48 hours or so. Just in other news on the military front, Russian forces are said to have terrorized two communities in the eastern district of Nikopol. That's in the south of Ukraine on the right bank of the Dnipro. Uh, overnight, we've heard that there's been a volley of at least 30 Russian shells there. Um, the uh, One of the heads of the regional and military vid- administrations there said that it was a difficult night. The Russians have terrorised two communities there. And he goes on and lists some of the, uh, the, the, the incidents that have taken place. Uh, There's also been another of the interesting uh, MOD, UK MOD uh, summaries today. 
on the current state of the Russian army. They've talked about what they still see as Russia's fundamental objectives in Ukraine, which of course is shoring up the annexed territories, those territories that of course went underwent those sham referenda several uh, weeks ago now, but also to take back those territories like Herzon that is currently under Ukrainian control. So the MOD still believes that is the Russians' intention, but they say that on their current analysis, they think it is very unlikely that the Russian military is able to generate an effective striking force capable of retaking these areas. It is the, it's unlikely they are able to make operationally significant advances within the next several months, which, of course, would speak to something that we spoke about last week on the podcast, which is the speculation that whilst in tighting, fighting is very, very fierce still around Bakhmut and some other uh, areas, that the fundamental uh, aim of the Russian army at this moment is to shore up its supply lines, to continue to bolster its forces in the hope of having more fortune in the military space after the winter period. But I'm sure, as I say, the Ukrainians will have something to say about that. And uh, just the last couple of stories. Uh, the riots are said to be threatening to break out in Mariupol. That's according to the local Russian official there. This is due to the amount of issues that there are infrastructurally in Mariupol. Of course, Mariupol is under Russian control at the moment. It has been since May and apparently the local people there are up in arms about the fact that they have lack of heating in homes, that there are leaking roofs and essentially that they're under uh, occupation. And indeed, the mayor of the city has said, and I'll directly quote, a riot is brewing in Mariupol. Propaganda images no longer work. Occupation authorities are silent while problems are piling up. All that is missing is a catalyst. So, of course, he uh, is, is no longer in the city, but is talking about just quite how severe things are there. And lastly, uh, James Cleverly, of course, British Foreign Secretary, somebody we've spoken about at length on this podcast, has said that Russia will use Ukraine peace talks to buy time to rearm. This, of course, comes under the off the back of the speculation that we spoke about at length in the last fortnight or so of the diplomatic manoeuvrings that are taking place uh, with dialogues with the Russians, with Putin, um, particularly led, we believe, by um, Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron at present in an attempt to not necessarily broker peace talks, but to try and lay some of the foundations for dialogue. And James Cleverly is articulating here what the fundamental fear of the Ukrainians is, which is that any attempt by the Russians to agree to a, a deal is really a fleeting uh, ceasefire for that will enable the Russians to gain um, momentum again, to build up the supplies and then to launch some other offensive when they are in a stronger position. And so he is warning uh, about the dangers of any uh, essentially uh, acquiescence to the Russians as a consequence of that. And as I say, that's something that's very much the echoed by the fear of the Ukrainians. And as I've spoken about previously, there is a very strong feeling that uh, whatever peace is signed at the end of this war, and it may be months, it may be years away, who knows, that will be one that will have to guarantee profound security guarantees for Ukraine. That is the only way that they are going to be willing to do so, uh, I believe, because they know that the, Russia is going to consistently be a danger uh, if they have any foothold in Crimea and certainly any foothold in what was formerly Ukrainian territory. So, sorry, Claire, quite a long uh, <laughs> monologue there, but hopefully that covers what was a very eventful 48 hours over the weekend. Eventful indeed. Thank you so much for that, Francis. Coming to you next, James, you were reporting over the weekend on the Russian military commander, Sergei Sorovkin, someone we've discussed on the podcast in the past, particularly regarding his role in Syria. You wrote that he has stabilised Russia's front lines in Ukraine and injected discipline into the Kremlin's army. What do we know about Sorovkin's methods and what impact has he had on the running of the Russian arm, army since his appointment in October? Good afternoon, Claire. Yeah, I was on the Moscow desk for the Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph this weekend. And uh, one of the stories I wrote about was some Western analysts. So this came from the Rand Corporation in the US, which is a security focused think tank and some other former very senior ex-Western military generals 
all all of them praising uh, Sergei Surovkin, who um, was appointed head of the Russian military in Ukraine in October. They were praising him in a way that needs to be contextualized. So when, when Surovkin took over as commander, the Russian army was on a Russian military in Ukraine was at a very low ebb. A month earlier, they'd routed from around Kharkiv in the northeast. They were they they had just mobilised nearly three hundred and twenty thousand men in Russia, and they had to incorporate all those men into the army. They were losing their grip on Kherson in the south, and there was stalemate in Donbass, the area which Putin had highlighted as, as a major key region. So when uh, Sorovkin took over, he he had a massive, massive intro of problems, and the these Western analysts were were, were really saying he, he you know he has instilled some discipline and some attention to detail and organisational ability. But the first thing since he took over, and the first thing he had to do was persuade Putin, obviously the commander in chief of the Russian army, uh, that he needed to allow the Russian army to retreat from Kherson in the south. He, he managed to persuade Putin to give him permission to do that, which, which shows how much influence uh, Sorovkin has over, uh, or not influence, but it's sort of, he's able to talk to Putin at a sort of sensible level, which perhaps has been missing uh, previously. So Putin gave the order to to allow the Russian army to retreat over over, over the Dnipro River from Kherson city, and at the time, Western analysts were saying this is a very very tricky military maneuver to pull off. The river is incredibly wide in parts. The Russian army will be under constant artillery fire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as we saw beginning of November, the first or second week of November. Uh, the Russian army did retreat from Kherson. It did, did did cross the river, and it did set up new trench lines, defensive lines, using the Dnipro River as a natural barrier. And these, um, the Rand Corporation and, and these other Western generals were saying that this was, in, 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 uh, this was actually quite a skillful, uh, you know, act of military maneuvering to, to to pull this off. And they say that the the way the trench system has been developed. Uh, across the river from Kherson is also a clever piece of of, of commanding and, and generalship, etc. And they really um, say this has come about after a series of poor commanders had had um, had had been failing on the battlefield. And this guy Zorovkin, who who was was in, was was uh, promoted in October. Uh, came in. Now he he's been dubbed, or so his nickname is General Armageddon, a sort of nickname, uh, catchy nickname, and one he earned when he was commanding Russian forces in Syria in 2016, 2017, and when he was happy to target civilian infrastructure there, uh, mass bombing campaigns, etc. This is actually part of Russian military doctrine. They see. Uh, targeting of civilian infrastructure as fair game in war because it puts pressure on on political leaders etc and, and and the military is distracting and uh yet again we've seen him take on this tactic in in ukraine uh he was he's been given by by all accounts by accounts from the russian media fairly free reign in in ukraine to conduct the campaign as as he sees fit and when he came in, General Armageddon came in, we saw this tactic of using ballistic missiles and drones to attack Ukrainian infrastructure really ramp up and accelerate. Um, so he, you know, that has come in under his watch. And also when the Russian military did retreat across the Dnipro River from Kherson City, since then, they've been um, firing huge amounts of artillery cells into the city fairly indiscriminately. Uh, contacts of mine was in Hassan last week, and he said well, in a few hours that he was there, there have been 56 uh, artillery shells flying over from the Russian side into the city centre. And it is depopulating the city, is making it unlivable in winter, etc. So uh, all these tactics... The, the sort of more com- the, the the greater competen- competency of of Surovikin, his his attention to detail his, his attention to discipline his successful retreat over the Dnipro River 
and his switching of tactics uh, to target a civilian infrastructure um, has changed the shape of the battlefield to a degree. It has stabilised it. Uh, we're in a much more stalemate scenario now. The focus has shifted away from uh, Russian retreats or routes and more towards how Ukrainians are going to get through this this cold winter, temperatures of minus 20, et cetera. Um, and and it, it was a fairly short story. It's really looking at that. There, there, there was one sort of caveat to all this um, put out by a, a former Australian major general who said that although sort of Ken has stabilised and, and is credited with doing a good job, et cetera, his commander in chief Putin will still be anxious, still be pushing him for a victory on the battlefield. So he will come under pressure at some point to deliver a victory to Putin. We, we, we know that Putin really enjoyed his initial successes in, um, in the Luhansk region of, of Donbass and celebrated when, uh, when, when, when uh, the Russian forces had supposedly conquered uh, Luhansk in, in June or July, I think it was. Um, and, he, and since then, they've been on the back foot, sort of can stabilise it, and Putin will now be putting pressure on him to come out with some sort of victory, maybe in Bakhmut, maybe somewhere else. If I could just jump, jump in there, James, I know you've been re- doing a real deep dive on him. And I just wonder what your sense is, if it's possible to have one, what you think his grand strategy is. As you say, he's very successfully, well, moderately successfully shored up the lines as we approach winter. But as the MOD was saying or are saying today, it's going to be immeasurably challenging actually for the Russians to be able to launch any kind of substantial offensive according to their intelligence. So what options are available to him? And do do, do you think there is a strategy or do you think at the moment it's still only phase one, which is shoring up the supply lines and and preparing the trenches as it were? I think, um, I I I think it's, 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 I, th- I, th- I think the retreat across the Dnipro River and, and the setting up of uh, trenches, etc., was a purely defensive measure. There's, there's very little scope for an offence um, in Kherson, but it was it was incredibly important for Sadovkin and Putin to stop the you know very successful uh, Ukrainian offensive south towards Crimea, which is absolutely vital that. Um, uh, for Putin, that 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 Ukraine does not attack Crimea proper, um, so I think that that has been uh, number one on on sort of list of priorities, and he's achieved it. I think uh, the for the Ukrainian military to now break over the Dnipro River and through the trenches, etc., will be a huge undertaking. I'm obviously not saying it can't be done, uh, but but it will be it will be incredibly difficult to do. Um, as far as delivering uh, some sort of victory for the Kremlin to get behind, um, we've been talking a lot, and there's been lots of reports about Bakhmut in um, in the Donetsk region, and uh, there's and you know the intensity of the fighting there suggests that the Russians have decided they really need to win that that victory. There's been a bit of, um, and depending on on who you read. Uh, the, the Western media, the Western intelligence sources have said that this is a crazy plan. Bakhmut doesn't really, uh, wouldn't really give Russia any strategic advantages, that sort of thing. Whereas if you read the Russian military bloggers and some of the Russian new, news websites, they, they, they will give a different sense of the importance of Bakhmut. And, and they'll, they'll tell their readers that this will strategically allow them to, to enact some sort of um, circling, encircling manoeuvre um, around that area, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're going to see more pressure on Bakhmut. I think that realistically is, is where a Russian, some sort of Russian victory may come. It's certainly sucking in a lot of Ukrainian forces. Um, and aside from that, uh, I think we're going to see more of this this uh, very cynical, these very cynical attacks on civilian infrastructure across Ukraine, putting pressure on Zelensky, putting pressure on the West, putting pressure on uh, the Ukrainian armed forces to help uh, millions of civilians out. I think it's a long term. I think Sorovkin and, and Putin have decided that this is a long term battle, uh, war, and you know they they've got to dig their heels in. Francis, I understand you have some more updates from Russia, so please could you share those? 
Sure. Well, I think we should return to to looking at Russia on the back of another curious story that's occurred in the last 24 hours, which I spoke last week about a major fire at a Moscow shopping mall. Well, it's happened again. There's a second one which is currently ablaze on the eastern outskirts of the city. The second such blaze in the last four days. Now, must stress that we don't think this has any relation to the Ukraine war at all. But nonetheless, it does speak to, well, bad optics for Moscow at the moment when you have two major, major blazes in your capital city in the space of four days. And it's believed that this one has something to do with a short circuit that came amid heavy rain in the city. Not believed to be any casualties. There are firefighters there. But as I say, it's very, very striking images. So I thought I should definitely raise it because I can imagine that there are some people who are looking at this and thinking that it might be somehow related to the war, given that this has happened twice in in the space of a week. But as I say, I don't believe that that is the case as far as we know thus far. Um, just one other story in Russia is we understand from bloggers, and it may be that James has a few insights on this as well, because I know that he follows them uh, very closely, that some Russian soldiers in Ukraine are openly criticising the war's poor leadership. So Igor Gherkin, former FSB officer who we've spoken about in the past, who helped Russia annex Crimea in 2014, has spent some time among the front lines and he said that there is discontent with the military top brass amongst the Russian forces. He's given a scathing 90-minute video analysing Russia's execution of the war. His words, as I say, he's not mincing them. Uh, He said the fish's head is completely rotten and that the Russian military needs to reform to bring its competent people uh, back in uh, to lead a successful military campaign. And he said that some at the mid-levels of the military are open about their dissatisfaction with the defence minister Sergei Shoigu and even Putin. And whilst the Russian defence ministry hasn't commented on this, it's caused, as I say, quite a stir online. But in those who are following the war closely within sort of the Russia military nationalist sort of core. Um, And so this is not the kind of demographic that you want to be upsetting but of course they have done because of the strategic mistakes that have been made in the war so far but what's concerning of course is that almost always their response is the same which is about escalation further mobilization and of course to be doing more saber rattling on the nuclear question so it's not necessarily a good thing this but nonetheless i think it is significant that you've got rather than it being a source from the ukrainians from western intelligence services this is from somebody who is actually a sympathizer for the russians or much more than that who is part of the russian military enterprise who is actually saying that uh, morale is not good, which, of course, would echo what we've uh, been reporting now for, for months, that, that morale is very poor in, in the Russian army and is likely to get worse over the winter for all of the obvious reasons. It's it's a miserable uh, conditions in which to fight in, which, of course, Dom has spoken about in the past based on his experiences. And uh, if you don't feel like you're adequately equipped, then, of course, that's going to get even more uh, um serious for the Russian top brass. Just another couple of stories in the sort of political diplomatic space as well, which I think is worth reporting on. Uh, The EU is currently meeting uh, to try and agree on further sanctions on Russia and Iran and an additional €2 billion for arms deliveries to Ukraine. Obviously, these are happening very regularly. It still remains unclear off the back of the story we reported last week whether Hungary will block some of these decisions. This is a lot more, uh, uh, someone's described it as blackmail diplomacy going on uh, behind closed doors. One can imagine how fiery they may be. Um, But nonetheless, these conversations are ongoing. Uh, Of course, the main reason that that there's this issue around Hungary at the moment is that Hungary have said that they will refuse to provide further support for Ukraine in the form of sanctions until some sort of agreement is made with the EU, who are currently punishing them for certain ways in which their government is conducting on legal affairs. It's all very complicated, but that's the essence of it. And so this saga is rumbling on. There's also been some rather embarrassing headlines for the European Union this morning involving a corruption scandal, uh, which, you know, may have no relevance to Ukraine at all. But... uh, but nonetheless, it speaks to a rather fractious period in in 
amongst the European Commission at the moment, some rather embarrassing headlines for them after a period of many months now of, of relative unity on the issue of Ukraine and other matters. So I only mention it for that for that purpose. Uh, just another couple of stories in this sort of diplomatic space. An international team is helping Ukraine gather evidence of sexual crimes. Of course, this has been a constant theme in recent weeks as the winter has set in. That there's a little bit more attention that's been shifting to this area. And uh, as I say, an international team of legal advisors have been working with local Ukrainian prostitutes in Herzon, gathering evidence of the alleged sexual crimes by Russian forces. It's a team by the Global Rights Compliance and International Legal Practice headquartered in The Hague um, and hasn't until now previously been reported their work on this. We are planning to do, as I say, some more research on this ourselves and do some interviews on this theme in the coming weeks, hopefully before Christmas. But that will depend on on obviously people's schedules who are working in this space. But it's not it's something that we very much um, have our eye on. So um, watch the space on that. And just lastly, because Turkey has been a consistent uh, uh, theme and their role in this uh, war as either a broker or as a sort of force trying to benefit uh, from from both sides in this war. It's been an interesting development in this space that Erdogan and Putin are discussing plans for a regional gas hub. That's what we understand it after a phone call. Of course, these countries are, are um, both very sort of reliant on each other in various different spaces. So to some extent, it's always been seen as inevitable that Turkey being a NATO country would have the more prominent back channels open with, uh, with Russia. But nonetheless, this is causing some concern, as you can imagine, some feeling that uh, this is another example of an inching forward in the diplomatic space of um, uh, sort of Turkey extending a hand to Russia, as I say, in an attempt to create a base in Turkey for exports of Russian natural gas. And indeed, apparently Gazprom chief Alexei Miller has also held Turks with Erdogan in Istanbul in the past week. So uh, there's also maybe be some dialogues going on about the grain deal as well. So it's a complicated picture, as I say, but you can imagine that some people are raising eyebrows, to say the least, on this question of Turkey and uh, the kind of conversations that they're having with Russia at the moment. But more on that as we know it. Thank you for that, Francis. Just going back to your first point there, for listeners who aren't familiar with Igor Gherkin, could you give us a bit of background information? Who is he and how well placed is he to make these remarks on discontent within the military? Well, he's a very prominent figure, uh, particularly in the blogging space now. He was formerly involved in the annexation of Crimea Bay back in 2014. He's sort of a bit more of a maverick now, I think it's fair to say. Um, he's sort of been involved in uh, very... He's got lots of followers on on various social media platforms and is, is as I say, somebody who, who likes his time in the sun. This event that uh, I've just been reporting on, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of 90 minute rant, I think it's fair to say. Um, so he, he, he likes the sound of his own voice. But I think actually he is a very significant person to follow because you get a sense of the general mood in, amongst the really hard line uh, Russian military types. And uh, so in that sense, he's he's worth following. Yeah, thank you, Francis, for that. We've discussed some conflicting ideas over the state of the Russian army this episode. So as we were speaking about earlier, the success that Sorovkin has seen in reforming and making sure that the army is more disciplined. And then more recent reports about defectors and now discontent in the top brass. I'm wondering, perhaps, James, you're able to come in on this. Which is an accurate look at the state of the army? And is either accurate? What are your thoughts? I definitely take everything Girkin says with a huge pinch of salt, a huge, huge, huge tub of salt. Um, this guy is a war criminal and uh, talks up his own, own book massively. He, he led... He, he he led the Donetsk uh, rebel forces in 2014, and and is 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 known to have shot people and uh, was involved with shooting down of the uh, Malaysian airliner. Um, since then, he he's gone to ground, and he 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 was such a, a renegade that the FSB he's an ex FSB colonel, and uh, the FSB actually got rid of him in the end because he was just too too much. Um, so from 2014 to earlier this year, he really went to ground. Um, in this war, um, he's reinvented himself as an ultra right wing um, analyst, military analyst, um, and is being is a massive opponent of something called Novorossiya, which is the term used by Catherine the Great in the 18th century 
when she expanded uh, the Russian Empire down through what is now Crimea, uh, Crimea and, and Ukraine. Um, and he, he, he's a proponent of, 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 of Moscow, uh, again, um, you know, uh, having a tough rule and a direct rule in, in, in the region, etc. And he's been ultra critical of the military throughout this war because he says they just simply haven't gone in hard enough. They should have done a full, mo- full mobilization a lot earlier. They should have uh, been bombing uh, Ukrainian towns a lot earlier. They should never have retreated from uh, uh, outside Kiev. They should never have retreated from Kherson. So he, he represents a very hardcore, uh, very right-wing faction, um, which doesn't even have direct power. Like he, he's, he's doing his own thing. Uh, he claims he's just been fighting in the front line, but um, I, I, you know, there's, there's, I don't think there's been any photos of that or any evidence. But he did disappear from the Russian telegram scene for a month or so. So m- m- maybe he, or maybe six weeks, maybe he has been there or not. Um, Girkin will will have his sources inside the, the Russian military and the Russian security agencies. But um, I don't know how accurate they are. I think that it is extremely difficult for Russian generals or colonels or whatever, brigadiers, a criminal brigadier, to defect. Um, I I don't think that's totally realistic. And I think that um, Putin and Sadovkin together have stabilized the situation and, and 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 the Russian army is back in business. It's a major menace um to the Ukrainians and it's a it's a very it's now a very tough opponent. I mean of course it always has been, but over the summer we saw them rout. Um that is no longer the case. Thank you for that, James. We're coming to the end of our time this afternoon. So if we can go to final thoughts. Francis, what would you like to leave our listeners with? Sure. Well, thanks, Claire. I just wanted to end with uh, the remarks by somebody who appeared on this podcast before she won the Nobel Prize, which is Alexander Matichuk. Um, she's spoken in Oslo over the weekend as part of her receiving of the Nobel Prize on behalf for the Centre for Civil Liberties in Ukraine. And she gave a very eloquent speech. And I just wanted to pick out some of extracts from it, although I recommend that listeners read it in full. Um, she says, peace progress and human rights are inextricably linked. A state that kills journalists, imprisons activists or disperses peaceful demonstrations poses a threat not only to its citizens. Such a state poses a threat to the entire region and peace in the world as a whole. Therefore, the world must adequately respond to systemic violations. In political decision making, human rights must be as important as economic benefits or security. This approach should be applied in foreign policy Two, people of Ukraine want peace more than anyone else in the world. But peace cannot be reached by a country under attack laying down its own arms. This would not be peace, but occupation. We must stop pretending deferred military threats are political compromises. The democratic world has grown accustomed to making concessions to dictatorships. And that is why the willingness of the Ukrainian people to resist Russian imperialism is so important. We will not leave people in the occupied territories to be killed and tortured. People's lives cannot be a political compromise. Fighting for peace does not mean yielding to pressure of the aggressor. It means protecting people from its cruelty. In this war, we are fighting for freedom in every meaning of the word, and for it, we are paying the highest possible price. This is not a war between two states. It is a war of two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. We are fighting for the opportunity to build a state in which everyone's rights are protected. Authorities are accountable, counts are independent, and the police do not beat peaceful student demonstrations in the central square of the capital. Humanity has a choice to overcome global crises and build a new philosophy of life. It's time to assume the responsibility. We don't know how much of the time we still have. And since this Nobel Prize ceremony takes place during the war, I will allow myself to reach out to people around the world and call for solidarity. You don't have to be Ukrainians to support Ukraine. It is enough just to be humans. I think I'll leave it there, Claire. 
Before the war, over 50% of Ukrainians were pet owners. So what happens to the pets owned by those who had to make the difficult decision to leave them behind? Indeed, hundreds and thousands of dogs and cats are living in war-torn streets without their owners. To cover this underreported aspect of the war, David Knowles spoke to CEO of the U Hearts Foundation, Yuri Tukarsky, whose organisation cares for animals displaced due to the invasion of Ukraine. This is their conversation. My name is Yuri. I run the U Hearts Foundation. That's a non-profit set up in Lithuania by the uh, largest Ukrainian pet food producing company, Kormatek, to respond to the challenges posed by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in February. Prior to uh, the large-scale invasion, I was running my own projects in Ukraine. I was focusing on entrepreneurship education for the youth. And uh, we were expanding our reach and most of our plans were unfortunately thrashed by by the war and uh, then when the opportunity arose my colleagues my friends from uh, Cormatech set up the foundation and asked me to help stand it up and start running aid projects to Ukraine. It started relatively small this effort because in February we were really running in all directions. Uh, There was all kind of aid coming into Ukraine and everybody was doing a small part, but we figured out uh, quite fast that as a team, in order to respond to this kind of scale of challenge, we need a totally different vehicle. We need a partnership uh, with other actors who are active in this field. So we set up a foundation and used Coromatech's corporate connections in the business of pet food industry and found great partnerships in Europe and in the United States that allow us to put together the campaign to rescue the pets in Ukraine. And we call it the Save Pets of Ukraine campaign. And since uh, the war began, we were able to attract mostly donations, in-kind donations, such as pet food. We were doing mostly disaster response in the first part of our activities. When the war began, the major displacement of people was happening uh, very early on. February and March, we had probably 10 million of Ukrainians who had to move home. Uh, six to seven million fled abroad and three to four more million relocated within the country. And to give you some context, before the war, over 50% of Ukrainians were pet owners. So this share, over 50%. 50%, So this share is fairly large. And you can imagine if you have 10 million people fleeing, there would be a lot of them who would either be carrying their pets with them or there would be those who would be forced to leave them behind because of the urgency of the situation, because of the logistics. And there is a huge number uh, of both those families who were moving with animals who needed help. And there was a huge number of those animals who were left behind who also needed help. So the degree of that disaster response was first focusing on how to help those people who are on the move and how to feed those animals that uh, required food. And we partnered up with the donors who could provide us with uh, these supplies and started to distribute them all over the country. We were present at all major railway stations, at all major hubs, helping the people on the move with backpacks, uh, with the necessities for their animals. And we were setting up regional storages, warehouse facilities uh, and working with volunteers to distribute pet food to those who were uh, requiring it at that moment. You mentioned that you had over 130,000 requests for help. What kind of requests are you getting? Could you talk us through some of the the case studies, some of the examples? Sure. It's about the food. Mostly uh, the vast majority of requests is coming from people that we call private pet volunteers. So these would not be registered shelters, but these would be private persons who would take care of uh, a large number of pets in their home. So either they would live 
in their house, the animals, or this would be people who would take care also of street animals. So they would do regular rounds of feeding animals, let's say in their area or in their district. So this would be the majority of requests we are getting. Uh, people who are taking care from 20 to uh, up to 100 animals in their area of or in their neighborhood and we would be able to help them meet their needs in, in food. We would also be installing street feeders. These are really simple feeding devices, tubes that uh, you can fill with pet food and the volunteers are doing the rounds. They would, uh, once a couple of days, they would travel to these mobile feeders, fill them up with food, and that would be mostly for street animals to use. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Are, are quite a lot of animals, are you, are you helping some of them leave the country as well in the same way that obviously lots of people have been forced to move? Do you, do you cover animals that are leaving Ukraine or, or are you focusing mainly on the animals that are staying? We're focusing on the animals inside Ukraine. Those who were leaving in the beginning of the large scale invasion together with their families, that was relatively unproblematic because many countries, neighboring countries have levied the restrictions uh, for animals to enter. And many countries, such as Poland, for example, even set up mobile vaccination stations right at the border so that people who did not have the vaccines or people who did not have the corresponding documents for their animals could go there, get the vaccinations and get the paperwork that allowed them to travel on safely. You mentioned in one of your earlier answers how a lot of what you were doing was essentially disaster response. And at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the huge movement of people and, and therefore their pets as well, often across Ukraine. What's the situation like now on the ground as we approach Christmas? The situation now has a different dynamics in the sense that there is no large scale uh, movement of the people, but the challenges that we are facing are a bit different. Uh, As we are approaching winter and the temperatures are falling down and we saw how the Russians are targeting the civilian infrastructure, electricity and heating, we are uh, launching a winter preparedness campaign for animal shelters. So we are helping uh, them obtain electricity generators that work on fuel and we purchase uh, and donate mobile heaters for them so that in the worst case scenario, when there is a lack of electricity, they can use the generator, connect the mobile heaters and keep their, fa- keep their animals warm for at least some period of time until the supply is restored. But still, the most important part also for the winter remains a high calorie, nutritious pet food that we continue to deliver. Although uh, we shifted our focus uh, more towards institutionalized shelters and uh, pet volunteers, focusing less on individual owners, because by now those displaced persons uh, would be already settled down in their new areas, would already have access to purchase pet food. So we are focusing on uh, the areas where the need is the most. So areas close to the front lines, and we're focusing on pet shelters and pet volunteers. Can you tell us a little bit about Operation Porpoise? This is, I think, another strand of your Christmas work and the Christmas hampers. Yes, a new project that we launched, focusing also not only on disaster response, but a bit of on the emotional support of the animals, so to say, because we want them also to feel a bit of that festive Christmas spirit. So we put together a program partnering with a major Ukrainian online retail platform by which there is an opportunity to purchase a hamper, a prepackaged set of goodies for cats and for dogs, and they would be sent to the shelter uh, ahead of the Christmas. So this campaign has been launched in the beginning of December, and it would be ongoing uh, up until the beginning of January, because in Ukraine, we also celebrate Christmas on January the 6th. So it would be running through Christmas time in the UK, then from the new year up until the Ukrainian Christmas. So we would be glad if the audience would look this up uh, on our website, uhearts.foundation and consider purchasing a hamper for a cat or a dog uh, in a Ukrainian shelter. So I'm I'm sure you can tell us what's in these hampers. What are the Christmas gifts you're giving to the animals? 
So there are a couple of necessities, uh, such as a blanket for, again, for challenges of the cold, but there are also some toys. There is also some food, uh, some treats for both dogs and cats. So something that's not just um, the regular food they're getting every day, but this is something more festive, more like a treat. Yuri, is there a particular dog or a cat or, or group of animals that you've encountered that really stand out in your memory? We have been helping mainly dogs and cats, but also there is one story that uh, uh, was also really heartwarming when we were able to help a zoo in uh, Mykolaiv, uh, who have been able to continue operating despite the security challenges, the bombing and the missiles, the shelling that was happening close to the area. And uh, the way the warmth with which the employees of the zoo treated their animals, uh, basically uh, trying to talk to them and trying to calm them down when they would hear loud sounds, uh, for instance, and uh, the degree of uh, devotion when they uh, at times would live on the premises of the zoo, not to leave their animals that are in their care on their own uh, was really great and fantastic to see. And we were able, thanks to our donors, also help uh, these animals in the zoo, not only with food, but also with uh, other specific supplies, so uh, such as hay and, uh, and uh, uh, medications. So that was one project that that uh, particularly uh, was uh, staying in, uh, in my memory. Yuri, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think our listeners uh, should hear or understand? I would say that we found uh, great partners in the UK, uh, a great response to our appeals for partnership, really, also in the uh, UK pet food industry. So there is also uh, one more uh, ongoing project that uh, I would perhaps shortly describe. Uh, A chain of pet food stores, Pets Corner, uh, is running an appeal that uh, uh, is well in line with our winter preparedness response. They are gathering uh, blankets for humans and they are gathering pet beds um, for uh, animals. So if there is uh, anybody who wants to make a donation of a blanket or of a pet bed, can do that in one of Pet Corner store across the country. Yuri, thank you so much for your time. That was really, really fascinating. And um, Merry Christmas and good luck with the Christmas appeal. Thank you very much for having me and Merry Christmas to you too. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings you stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Emily Hill.